Today we'll be talking about walking cities, cities on the go, because there are no clickbait titles on this show. So today's topic is mobile cities, and we'll be covering everything from small settlements to big moving metropolises, from those floating on sea or in the sky to those running around on giant legs like a spider tank or big tank treads, like the behemoths we see in the film Mortal Engines. Now to some degree, we don't need to know the reasons why we might want a city to be mobile, just how to make it work. It's such a cool concept that we'd be interested in looking at it regardless of whether it's practical or not. That said, there are some compelling reasons that we might want to have a mobile city, either cultural or pragmatic, and we'll get to those later. We'll take a look at some of the examples in science fiction, from the crazy to the more plausible, but we will also ask how we could make these things practical and what sorts of cultures might make them so. We also need to acknowledge from the outset that all cities are mobile already. If you look at maps of cities over generations, they tend to creep around the landscape like some sort of amoeba blob. There have been cases where entire cities have been moved by disassembling and moving the very stones they are made from, like Karuna, Sweden that is currently being moved 3 kilometers east, building by building, a process that will take over a decade and is planned to be completed in 2035. Today we're contemplating considerably faster moving ones, but those moving around within a world, not orbiting it or some immense spaceship or habitat that itself moves like an arc ship or an O'Neill cylinder. And we're also not really thinking about cities that are established and expecting to be permanent, but instead end up being moved for another reason. In history this is the bulk of examples, for instance where a city needed to be moved away from a specific place due to the construction of a dam that would leave the area flooded or needed to be moved off a flood plain or to higher ground because of rising sea levels. Instead, we are looking for settlements that move around by land, sea, or air, or maybe on ice or lava too, and possibly even disassembly and reassembly itself periodically. In the end, so long as you got a couple key technologies, you can absolutely make these sorts of moving cities work. That can be ultra energy abundance, so you don't really care how much juice it takes to run your giant shield helicarrier to ultra-airtight durable tanks that you can fill with helium and not worry it will leak out, or better access to cheap helium, which might be ultra-abundant on some worlds, or hydrogen-resistant coatings, or just good old-fashioned anti-gravity. We'll discuss those options and more in a bit, but the real problem with mobile cities isn't if you can build one, but for what reasons you would. The key question is to ask why you would move a whole city instead of just sending out rovers to collect what you need and bring it back. This seems pretty obvious to us now, where most of us live in permanent houses or apartment buildings, but we certainly have precedent for moving whole settlements. It is literally what the nomad life is all about and has been an extremely common approach to living throughout human history. Nor is it absent in the modern world even today, with things like recreational vehicles and houseboats and hashtag van life trending on social media fairly regularly. One difficulty with nomadic life is it tends to limit you to what you can carry, and you need to make do with no infrastructure, but we shouldn't take for granted that weight restriction is as important in higher tech civilization or to a culture which being nomadic is vital to their way of life. Higher tech options can decrease mass, or make it easier to carry mass. After all, how heavy is a wall between rooms or a floor if it is made out of some super strong material and highly insulated against heat and sound? How heavy is it if every wall is actually a tank you fill with water or fuel for more insulation and as storage, or with helium? How many rooms does a house really need when your residents are packed full of augmentations allowing them to watch shows or plug into VR without any gear or just direct neural linkage? Spaceships are all about mass, not size, so a lot of colony vessels to new star systems might be adapted to cultures that put a big focus on minimizing the mass of personal accommodations and gear, and that could easily translate into the eventual colony on a new world. We probably need to start by asking what sort of energies are involved in walking, floating, or levitating some giant city, which probably needs to start by asking how much a city weighs and emphasis on ways because some giant land crawler running around on the moon, leaching minerals and helium-3 off the surface, is a lot easier to roll around than some giant tank on a high gravity planet. 
One upside though is that unless we're talking high speed cities, we can mostly ignore air resistance, which is another reason why weight is more important than mass in this discussion. Either way, what is the weight? I have seen a number of loose napkin math estimates for an entire city weight. 10 billion tons for New York City was one figure, with a decent value for the approximation, but I suspect ships like oil tankers and aircraft carriers is your better basis for an estimate. Those tend to be in the hundreds of thousands of tons range, not billions, which is five orders of magnitude smaller, though also home to a thousandth of people, so maybe we could estimate 10 to 100 tons per person loosely. Bigger vehicles tend to get better mileage per ton than small ones, especially at lower speeds. Tanks and semis are way more fuel efficient than even the best modern sedans, in tons per mile per fuel used, but none of those are truly big. While the biggest vehicles in terms of raw mass are giant bucket excavators for mining coal, for a while the space industry had the biggest land vehicle, or vehicles. NASA's twin transport crawlers for rockets, Hans and Franz, are originally designed to carry 2,700 tons or 6 million pounds, and were each 40 meters or 131 feet long by 35 meters to 114 feet wide. Their newer upgrades push that capacity to 8,200 tons or 18 million pounds. It might be surprising that its engine's only a few thousand horsepower, the typical personal vehicle being a couple hundred. Essentially, you would only need one horsepower per ton, which makes intuitive sense anyway, given an actual horse could pull a ton easily enough. Those crawlers burned around 300 liters of diesel per kilometer, or 125 gallons per mile, and they typically made their trip at a mile per hour, so they were not fast, they moved about a half or a third of the average person's walking speed. But for context, If you built a city on such a platform, it could move itself from New York to LA in a little over a hundred days, and at a fuel efficiency of around 20 miles a gallon per ton. This sort of platform can be made bigger and faster, and while diesel engines or going steampunk is visually tempting, let's switch over to electric and imagine a nuclear powered one instead, and for simplicity, we'll also assume one kilowatt of power production will let us equal our horsepower or move one ton of city at a slow walking pace. We are just aiming for some easy to recall figure accurate to an order of magnitude here. In that same vein, 20 kilograms per kilowatt hour of power is reasonable for a ship reactor, or 50 kilowatts a ton, 50 times what we need to move that ton, so it is pretty plausible you could have a city that was less than a tenth its mass in reactors, engines, and actual wheels, axles, tracks, etc. without needing to assume any really advanced hyper-technology. Needless to say, if we're talking about a megaship or floating island, it's even easier than moving across the ground, and the same for a mostly buoyant airship or sky city. If you want it running as a big helicopter or airplane, which would be faster too, you're adding an order of magnitude to your energy budget. If you are putting this thing on a significantly lower gravity world, Mercury or Mars or the Moon, then it's an order of magnitude less energy needed. So this is surprisingly a very plausible concept on the Moon, where your mobile mining platform might actually run on solar power and need to creep across the landscape over the Moon's month-long day-night cycle to remain always in sunlight. Even at the equator, the day-night terminator only moves at just under 10 miles per hour, or just over 15 kilometers per hour, and is much lower closer to the poles. It would need to be even slower on Mercury or Venus, and a lot of the bigger moons in the outer solar system have very long days too due to them being tightly locked to their planet. As to why you would build that way, well it takes a lot of additional gear to move and work safely in a vacuum with people, part of why we like robots so a big mobile miner on an airless low gravity planet or moon would seem to make more sense, especially as you can get away with giant and ultra lightweight solar mass where there's no wind and where all your terrain is dry as a bone. All your crew and equipment is right there, all inside nice thick holes and airlocks. Another thing to keep in mind is that on a place like Earth, we do have the option of buoyancy in the atmosphere, and we mostly don't use it because helium, the second most common substance in the universe, is ultra rare on Earth. Hydrogen, the most common substance in the universe, is also not terribly common on Earth either, and also has the quality of being incredibly explosive, which isn't so great for safety. They both are way lighter than air as molecules, great for buoyancy, but they leak through things. 
If you have tanks that are lightweight, sturdy, and airtight, you can effectively have a long-lasting floating balloon that rarely needs replacing. We do not necessarily need an entirely buoyant structure floating over the landscape, but if you can make strong, durable parts that are hollow but filled with lightweight gas, or even vacuum if you can make them strong enough, an awful lot of your structural weight might be decreased while adding in a lot of buoyancy to cut weight down. Needless to say, some sort of awesome anti-gravity technology is even better. That is really the only way you can get away with airborne floating fortresses or upside down mountains with cities on them, which are so popular in the fantasy genre like the wizard enclave cities of Netheril in the Forgotten Realms. They are usually doing it by some variation of magic, but barring anti-gravity, you can only do that if all that height and depth is made out of a net buoyant material, which rock obviously is not. Different planets, different options though. For instance on high sea and worlds, your surface gravity would generally be a bit higher than on Earth, as these are bigger planets which we assume have higher concentrations of free hydrogen and helium in the atmosphere, and maybe very deep oceans below, but very high pressure at the surface, be it land or sea. So much like on the airless worlds, a self-contained large mobile environment makes more sense, and normal air might be naturally buoyant at standard pressure but you can grab hydrogen or helium out of the air and superheat them with waste heat from your reactors for good lifting gas too. Just keeping to our earlier figure of needing a kilowatt a ton to move a big land crawler on an Earth-like planet and more if you want to go faster, we should probably note that the viability of this is very dependent on your energy cost and vehicle maintenance cost. If you got some sci-fi sturdy material like adamantium to be building your tracks and axles out of, and some fusion reactor gushing out megawatts for pennies, yeah this sort of mobile city works just fine, and in point of fact is a lot cheaper to move around than those big mobile space habitats we often discuss, especially at the interplanetary scale. We are also assuming that roaming cities are self-propelled in this case, but you could have dome habitats, even very large ones, that were built with being lifted in mind, and many such mobile cities exist but are stationary until a swarm of big heavy lifters come by to move one, then head off to help migrate one of its sister cities. It's not really a weight issue either, even in a modern context. Your typical modern home mass is between 40 to 80 tons, so using our earlier figure from the NASA crawler, you would only be burning 2-4 gallons of diesel per mile you wanted to move, and at modern cost that would be $10-20 to $20 a mile, and moving halfway across the state might only cost a few thousand bucks, which is certainly a better option than many days spent packing and unpacking and all the time and cost with realtors and movers. It's not really that we would expect a post-scarcity civilization to have every house have its own means of transport, but it might get a lot more plausible that mobile home, in a future context, might mean one built with the idea that you could untether the house and then some massive megacopter could swing by, attach tethers, and lift some 500 ton mansion to your new preferred address, possibly all during a single afternoon while you are off running errands and without even spilling the water glass you forgot and left on the kitchen table. Which is a thing to remember in terms of these big mobile cities, you would expect them to be vibrating and shifting around a lot and quite loud. I remember riding around in big tracked vehicles in the army a lot and it's definitely not a place you can really sleep or concentrate in, even with practice. Or at least I could not, we did have a couple guys in the unit who could nap inside the thing somehow even when we were bumpy along at high speed, so presumably that is something people could adapt to. So too, you've got stuff jarring around and spilling, but ships already have to deal with that, and there are plenty of folks who spend much or even most of their life on ships bigger ones sway around less too. Some civilization in a mobile tracked city or artificial island dwarfing an aircraft carrier might not have much shaking and swaying going on, and after a few generations might be totally adapted and habit and custom too. There are things you could do to dampen that noise and vibration, arguably big long telescoping legs are better than tracks for that, though as awesome as a giant walking city would be, I really have difficulty justifying that option outside of highly cratered and creviced moons, which is just easier to walk around in low gravity and have your city on big spider legs than wheels or tracks. Also it is important to remember the weight with things having feet. Some big tracked vehicle that has nearly as much track surface area as the vehicle has would leave huge ruts on anything but very hard ground, 
and the bigger a critter is, the even larger its feet need to be to distribute its weight so it doesn't sink, just like walking on soft ground wearing riding boots versus high heel shoes. Same for sturdiness of leg bones, you need them to be strong and stable enough so they don't buckle under the weight as you move. Wide and flat works better for a mobile city, not some skyscraper with legs, and if you're doing legs, it may be better to emulate the centipede not the biped, or even the arachnid. So far we've mostly talked about moving across the ground, but there are more options for moving in water or some other liquid. A mobile city might be a submarine, moving around water or some other fluid by propellers and buoyancy, like the giant city sub Universalis in the book Under Sea, which roams around for resources as well as to stay out of danger and away from its rival city sub, the population. It might be a big sphere of a city moving through an ice ward by slowly melting its way around the ice, or floating around on lava, not water, or moving through a planetary mantle, which might occur on a Sithonian or volcanic planet. Those wards might even allow for magnetic levitation in many cases, others might have cities hanging from huge orbital rings by tethers, like the chandelier cities we discussed in Colonizing Neptune. We still haven't really covered why you're moving through, and that is a problem that we can't really hand wave as it's often not going to make sense to move a city. It definitely does in some cases though, and a big spaceship designed for continuous thrust, powered by a torch drive or a micro black hole, might just land and power down on a planet like a giant skyscraper or arcology, or even just roll over the surface with the engine on, though unless it's using something more benign like neutrinos or dark matter for its thrust, it would be like rolling over the landscape with a giant flamethrower. But let's start with the easier to justify cases. Floating cities on Venus or huge gas refineries on Jupiter or Neptune, where movable cities are basically the only option for being there. On a place like Mercury, you're doing it to stay out of the Sun, which moves over many months, so there you could have some big mobile city trying to stay in the dark where it's cooler to do its mining, moving on over days, and that place might even utilize stilts and legs and have a big reflective umbrella over it one of the mushroom habitats we discussed in Colonizing Mercury for being on the day side, since walking with feet means way less touching of the ultra-hot ground, letting you keep a livable temperature inside the facility. This episode is mobile cities, so we're all contemplating ones that are stationary most of the time and can just be moved, and we have tons of historical and modern examples of that, from tent cities to huge caravans of recreational vehicles. The main reason for mobility in those examples is that whatever the lifeblood of that city is, is moving. For example, following migrating animals for food or sport or entertainment. In our Hive Wards episode earlier this year, I mentioned an example of the Hive City of Nessus from Gene Wolfe's Dying Earth series, Book of the New Sun. There, the city is slowly moving away from the original spaceport that was the old city as it heads down a river as the planet slowly freezes. It just moves over time and folks raid and rob the mostly abandoned buildings of prior generations. Mobile cities pillaging the world definitely work well in more dystopian settings, be they post-apocalyptic or dying Earth, but it's viable in other cases too, even on modern Earth. And also it's important to note that although most mobile cities are moving towards something that its inhabitants want, like more resources or better weather, a city also might want to move away from something it doesn't want be it a political threat or even bad weather. We could imagine a mining operation wanting to pull up and out of dodge if a super strong storm developed on the planet or the moon it was working on, or if a volcano started to erupt and threatened to melt it completely. Moving around based on either wanting to go towards something or away from it is obviously very common in hunter-gatherer cultures, but it's normal enough in agrarian ones too. In the plain states like Kansas, it really isn't unusual for harvesting those vast fields of wheat to involve basically a rolling wall of vehicles and a lot of harvesters to make a 1500 mile trek from there up to Canada, just harvesting fields as they go. I could imagine a world in which that was state owned or organized where some single huge mobile harvester, miles wide and fairly thick, just rolled non-stop over the monocrop field both night and day, same for planting and was just a mobile town, complete with shops and schools and churches and such. But a mobile city might not need to use much power either, especially if it relies on other things that can move like ocean currents or wind patterns. The raft in Neil Stephenson's Snow Crash comes to mind here, 
The Black Market Hub City was a loosely connected flotilla of ships instead of a single structure, and being that it was too big to steer in any meaningful way, it mostly moved by ocean currents, with some slight diesel power to get it to the right places, and traveled all around the Pacific over the span of several years. So that example brings us to the next thing to consider. A mobile city also need not be a single huge machine, it might be a bunch of components that can move separately and reassemble on the end, or separate for a while and then rejoin into a larger group, or move together staying loosely connected the whole time. The Freedom Ship proposal, which was more like a fleet of barges than a single ship, was designed as a mobile community of up to 80,000, and we discussed that general concept more in seasteading, where you might have a lot of square or hexagonal standardized components that could just link back together as a grid of whatever arrangement you wanted, and with bits coming or going, migrating themselves. The same applies to floating cities in the sky or on gas giants or places like Venus. There are a few practical reasons you might want to do this too. For any kind of seasonal shift, it might make sense to reconfigure the city to take advantage of different temperatures, available resources or any number of other things that can come on a cycle. These need not be external forces either, it's easy to imagine any number of cultural reasons to reconfigure or move a city based on human whims, like the Aurora Borealis, moving north according to the 11 year solar cycle so you're more likely to catch them, or avoid the rainy west coast of North America for the peaks of the El Nino Southern Oscillation Cycle and instead enjoy more sun by floating your city near Japan where it will be sunnier, and while you're at it why not reconfigure the city to get rid of all the tall buildings for optimal viewing for the Tsukimi, the traditional autumn moon viewing festival. As for how to get it done, it's all about the technology you have on hand. For instance, the city ship of Atlantis from the Stargate franchise is first shown to us as a fully functional spaceship, able to travel between galaxies, and we frequently contemplate giant spaceships bigger than cities on this show for mundane interstellar colonization, and whole planet ships for intergalactic colonization. So it's worth keeping in mind that those spaceships, while not designed for atmospheric travel or orbital insertion, would not generally have a problem floating around on an ocean or under one for that matter, even without the powerful force field Atlantis uses for deep diving itself in that show. If you've got shields and abundant energy or anti-grav, then it all works just fine. Low gravity makes it easier too. In the John Carter film set on low gravity Mars, the Zodanga have a mobile city, though they don't have that in the original books, just the film. Mortal Engines does have it in the film and the book, the Attraction Cities, that can move around the post-apocalyptic landscape to avoid earthquakes and volcanoes and so on, and eat other cities, moving or not. The notion of municipal Darwinianism in the setting is a fascinating one, albeit I couldn't rate it as super realistic. We see a couple other examples in the Warhammer 40,000 setting too, Ambulon from the Dark Heresy setting that migrates between different types of resources it needs, floating ones like Atlantis are common too, the video game Civilization Beyond Earth has migrating floating settlements in the Rising Tide DLC. And again, the fantasy genre loves them, the floating cities of the Wizard Kings of Netheril from the Forgotten Realms or the flying castles from Dragonlance come to mind. And there are tons more. They are also quite the staple of the steampunk genre, be they tracked or the ones walking around on legs. I can think of lots of various plausible scenarios for ward setups or cultures or combinations of technology that might make such a place reasonably common, but probably never the main way humanity housed itself, on planets anyway. As channel regulars know, we tend to assume most humans will live in artificial space habitats like O'Neill cylinders in the future, and those are inherently mobile. And in that regard, we would assume mobile cities would be the norm for humanity, whether it's orbiting a planet or migrating around to new asteroids to mine or turning the engines on and moving your whole giant O'Neill cylinder to a different region of the solar system, or even a new solar system. So yes, mobile cities will be a thing in the future, probably both on and off planets. How well they match up with their portrayals in fiction is hard to say, but whether or not those portrayals are realistic, I think as we move into the future, there will definitely be places for moving cities too.
Last week we were talking about lunar mining and refining, and after I finished that episode, I felt something missing was looking at the lives miners on the moon might have, particularly nomadic prospectors, and today's topic reminded me we can build huge mobile mining platforms that might be as populated as an offshore oil rig or a small town. So I did a bonus episode, Nomadic Miners on the Moon, which is available now exclusively on Nebula, our streaming service, where every episode comes out early and ad-free, both our videos and our audio-only podcasts, no ads or sponsor reads, like this one. If you subscribe to Nebula, not only do you see every regular episode of SFIA a few days early and ad-free, but we have lots of bonus content, including extended editions of mini-episodes, as well as bonus and exclusive content like Nomadic Miners, Orc Ore and Free Will, Conformal Cyclic Cosmology, Planets vs. Megastructures, Space Freighters, Colonizing Binary Stars, and many more. Nebula is a streaming service started by creators for creators and their audiences, and is going to be the largest creator-owned streaming service, with tons of great content from an ever-growing community of creators. Using my link and discount, it's available now for just over $2.50 a month, less than the price of the drink or snack you might have been enjoying during the episode, and it goes to supporting new content from myself and other creators, like our new feature, Nebula Classes, so it's two for the price of one. When you sign up at my link, go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur, and use my code, IsaacArthur, you not only get access to all the great stuff Nebula offers, plus now classes, you also be directly supporting this show, again to see SFIA early, ad-free, and with all the exclusive, bonus content, go to go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. If you finished up today's topic and still want more, we have an NSS Space Forum tonight, Thursday, July 13th, 9pm Eastern Time, where Dr. Doug Plata will be discussing the insta-based concept for inflatable habitats for using on the Moon or Mars. You can check that out live and ask questions, or catch it and any of our prior other weekly forums over on the National Space Society's own YouTube channel. And speaking of the Moon, we'll be looking at the possibility of building a lunar space elevator on August 3rd. But before that we still have plenty more content for the rest of July, continuing this weekend with our mid-month Sci-Fi Sunday episode, Robots and Warfare, and a look at the role drones and autonomous machines might have in the future, along with finding out what the first rule of warfare in the future will be. After that we'll discuss whether or not alien life forms might be based on ammonia instead of water and what that might look like. Then we'll continue our look at the future of warfare with dropships and planetary invasions or boarding actions. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service, Nebula, along with hours of bonus content, at go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. As always, thanks for watching, and have a great week!